my takeaway from this is that this is a good conversation. I think everyone <coughs> feels like the local regional is complicated and maybe opening it to Montana feels like it's more inclusive, but the value space needs to be communicated if that's where we want to go. So just keep chewing on it and we'll keep having the conversation. I do want to just say that somebody spoke in the PK talks yesterday. I do not in this moment remember who it was, but the word authentic was used and I, it struck me when it was said. And so just listening to everybody, the synthesis that I got out of it, and I'm just throwing it back at you to see how it fits with you, was authentic food, Montana produced and process. Does, does, does something along those lines kind of we lean you into capturing both the family of Montana and the values of who we are? So it's just something to think about. So we're going to break out into subgroups. Why not? I don't know how many we are, but the idea was to break out into uh, the area where you identify as your primary role or where you have a primary interest in a gap. You know, it could be that maybe you're a producer, but your main struggle is with the distributors or something. And you have a, you have a real focus there where you want to um, have a conversation. And so we're going to, we'll have this conversation about gaps break in our little breakout sessions. We're going to take the next, sure, we'll the rest of the time to do a report and, well. and if you guys you. could focus the reporting maybe on one or two highlights. other pillars of our local food system um, and our favorite points um, turned out to be uh, distribution and transportation across the state so when, whoever it was that can't remember because now everyone moved but someone said about um, how trucks can take things on on their return trip and that actually doesn't really um, make a, a that much of an impact with carbon footprint so making that um, more efficient um, then we, we really liked what we said about consumers, um, re creative reduction of waste, uh, quality control with contaminants, um, and how herbicides can slip into compost, persist through the compost process, and then damage someone's garden for years to come. Um, and then also seeing value in the food waste. So we talked about how um, glass recycling is disappearing across Montana, and people are um, so emotionally tied to not putting their glass in the trash can, what if people had the same concept with their food and were, you know, holding on to their food waste and not wanting to put it in the garbage can if they didn't have another option. So, um, kind of flipping that, uh, that perception there. Um, our legislation piece, uh, we, we kind of came to some um, examples out of Kalispell, Missoula, um, that uh, have a local ordinance that people just sweep their or you know rake their leaves into the curb and the city will come by and collect it it's easy for residents um, and the the city already has the infrastructure to do major collections like that because of snow plowing and street cleaning and it's already um, and it's you know a practice we're familiar with um, and then also creating zero waste institutions and schools hospitals and teaching people through uh, those collective spaces how to be uh, less wasteful on our reverse side, um, we talked again about uh, what's missing, um, and that, uh, mainly that came up, up again with transportation, that um, we could be using some logistical software to figure out how to make that transportation piece more efficient, um, because it's really hard to wrap your brain around how, you know, delivery trucks can, can be, you know, creating these new routes that deliver the things that they need to deliver, and at the same time, um, collecting the waste from the institutions that they're 
you know, restaurants or uh, cafeterias that they're delivering to, um, and where those composting facilities need to be in relation to distribution centers and warehouses. So I think that was the highlights of our, yeah. Yeah, of cool. our group. Okay, uh, consumers, come on up. My name is Josh. I'm a consumer. <laughs> <laughs> um, we didn't we didn't get a, a, a nice, pretty <laughs> thing all together for you guys, but we had a lot of great thoughts. So I'll try and summarize what uh, what happened. I don't know if you want to pin it I can't. Okay. I can do both. I'm not that talented. No. One of the things we thought as consumers we could use support in or gaps that we had was. The, the idea of educating people on the <coughs> this kind of dynamic between the value of food that's meaningful, food that you know, has environmental impact, and the other side of that dynamic is the cost of that food and what the cost of real food is. And that's a common complaint we hear from trying to advocate to our friends, you guys should shop better. We're like, oh, it's expensive. We're like, is it though? Anyway, so some education would be great, support we need. Um, as well as the information fo for folks who have been educated like that or, or wherever they're at with their food journey, just what the resources are for finding these, these people who are growing this kind of food. Some other highlights we're talking about, we're thinking people who could help us with these things are the nonprofits and their, their outreach and their education. We can't always rely on nonprofits though, so we're saying maybe some sort of initiative like one of our group members brought up as an example for smoking, like a cigarette tax, and the money from that tax went back into Medicaid to kind of expand and help people with that. Something like that for nonprofits could be interesting. Um, another highlight for us, we were talking about kind of the who's missing, Just who's not here, you know? We need, to, we need to reach out to these other consumers. That's what we were thinking. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's, that's that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Much more. Okay, distribution. Picture. Okay, Jeff. Hi, my name is Jeff. I'm a consumer. Got lots of um, lots of lines and arrows and such. So we talked about, um, we really started out talking about challenges. What are the, the biggest challenges? And one of the things that kept coming up is um, corporate food stores and how hard it is to get into um, the large stores, the Albertsons, the, the Safeway, that kind of thing. Um, there's limited incentive for those um, stores and they really don't have the ability to make some of those decisions. Some of that is, is too much dictated by their, um, their corporate offices. Um, institutions are challenges because of budget and also because of policy. But there was some, it was interesting that there was some discussion about how there seems to be more local food here in Bozeman than there is in the other MSU locations. And just curious about that. I don't know what kind of policies they have here. Um, Food deserts, uh, the, the dollars to ship and pick up, and there was some of that discussion about, you know, the eastern part of the state, um, it's too far to go, it's not cost effective, they don't have as much business there, um, and in terms of bringing something back, that's great, that was a part of a discussion too, if they're going to go someplace to be able to bring something back. but. Again, if there isn't a lot there to be able to pick up, it's hard to justify the cost of doing that. Um, and then also the other thing that, that came up under food deserts is the interest. And part of that might be education. Part of it is just that, you know, some of these small um, institutions, grocery stores, whatever it might be, they just don't have the interest in buying something that is <coughs> local, regional, whatever you want to call it. Um, so whether it's because they're not educated or um, they don't have the demand from their customers, you know, who knows, but that's that's a uh, concern. I'm gonna skip over this. And then we got down to um, seasonality. 
Uh, and the challenge there is staffing and then um, production or um, that relates to, of course, producers, but um, that there isn't production for a longer season. So if they're selling to a restaurant, being able to keep that chef engaged and wanting to buy product through them, um, if it were a little bit longer growing season, that might be helpful. Um, storage is a very short term problem and they can't afford to purchase say refrigerated storage for the whole, or rent storage for the whole year when they only need it for such a short period of time but in the, the height of the season that's a concern um, we talked about policies for um, institutions to buy local could there maybe be more that might be um, that might be something and that also would come under um, pillars and then we talked about that um, they don't do any distribution into tribal areas um, that at this point that's a kind of a one-way thing there's a, uh, a distributor that picks up from uh, one of the tribal groups and sells a product but no deliveries going that direction um, and then we started talking about other pillars and how that could could come into play and you know we talked about education again that might relate back to the interest um, in some of these other categories but education through schools um, someone mentioned YouTube and then also publicity or as someone else referred to it as outreach however you want to want to call that and then um, producers, if they could lengthen their season by doing some, um, maybe some hoop house, uh, high tunnels, something like that. So they've got that, produce, um, that production for a longer season, which is one of the challenges um, to be able to have more product available. Um, I, the thing that, and you please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but the thing that seems to be coming out here that would really help them is if they could get past this um, seasonality and storage and we're not talking about 12 months out of the year just a longer season and the problem with the short-term storage um, anything else that was a really like a, a big hitter that I maybe didn't mark okay and Jan do you mean in the storage, just to clarify, uh, storage by who? The distributor? The distributors. Hold. Okay. Yeah. Great. The distributors. And did you? I was. Did, was there any discussion on where you might find those resources, or is that still an unknown? That is still an unknown. Okay. Um, yeah, and part of that with the producers um, producing longer, that's an education piece. Um, that's a, a business plan piece. Um, so the storage could be who's not in the conversation yet like just thinking outside the box there possibly okay possibly great thank you um so this is producer are you producers and processors over here you look like one big group no you two groups yes yeah, one big group okay yes, okay was there anybody in processing no i think it's a gap <laughs> 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 We had a lot of ideas, but one that we didn't think about was um, creating a whole nother sun so we could extend the growing season. So sorry about that. <laughs> I thought, dang it. Um, we had a great group. Uh, really hit the hit the ground here running. So the the difficulty, the pinch point for us, um, it seemed uh, for the group was producers each other, um, all of us in terms of not collaborating enough, not talking enough about um, what they're producing, seems to be a saturation at markets because that lack of having discussions. The other thing that really came up in the beginning but also came up at the end um, was legal help, almost having like a legal team, a set of resources, some counsel, um, business advice, um, how to grow. Um, markets, market analysis. Um, there's a lot going on in Montana that you guys already know, but just a lot of things that just on the verge of expo exploding. And so a major pinch point was really having um, 
market identification, um, progressive assistance, marketing, um, small business development, almost having like that's who's missing is almost like a team um, to go to for that progressive whole nother level um, beyond. Uh, let's see, there was processing did get mentioned. Um, if you're organic certified, you um, have to go a long ways to get it done or you can't get in, so that's a huge problem. When your stuff's ready, it's ready. Um, let's see, where was the... We did talk about seasonal, um, which also tied into this first conversation about working together, and then as the longer the time, our time went by together, we basically got to hear about, and I don't think, I don't think the abundant map does this, but it might. Um, having almost a seasonal regional menu, so to say, that you can communicate to your consumer about here's what's in season in western part, middle part, eastern part of Montana. Um, here's when things come into season because we cannot invent a whole nother sun. It isn't going to happen. <laughs> this is um, what we're doing, but also it would collaborate um, within the group about uh, or communicate in the group about, hey, you're growing radishes. We talked a lot about radishes, this is what I remembered. Um, why don't you think about asparagus? Can you diversify into asparagus? Or, you know, just talking about how we can kind of all get on board and we all get a piece of the pie instead of one of us getting a lot of, a lot of the pie. Um, so that's really what these nice pictures are about. Here are your seasons, because I'm a picture person. So here's what you can get in Montana all year. Here's what you can get in each season, where to go, where to get it, um, and then those groups talking to each other. Yeah, I think to add on to what a previous group said, the seasonality issue, I mean, it can be a variety of overlapping solutions just to uh, better satisfy consumer expectation, especially until consumers can be educated to adjust their expectations seasonally. So some season extension opportunities, whether that's hoop houses and veggie production, or changing calving and lambing schedules and breeding schedules, obviously before that. Um, and then seasonality education, you know, for consumers, including chefs, institutions, grocers, um, and individual households. And then the last question, um, what role can we play in resolving? We did this in basically five seconds or less. You can tell by my handwriting. but. Um, it must have come up the entire time we were together, but this collaborating, communicating, um, a lot of vertical collaboration across the entire system, like that's kind of what's going to make the, the whole world go around, I think, for us. Um, a lot, or not a lot, but quite a few times um, calling your local reps because one really important thing that was mentioned out was that um, producers feel like they have to go to and find information, but it would be great, and a lot of other groups mentioned it too, that outreach piece about how can we get more extension agents to be able to buy some time to go out, um, like lessen their paperwork or something, or researchers, I don't know. That's your department. More but capacity. <laughs> call in your local reps, and don't forget to say thank you. Your reps being extension? Well, I think, um, you know, like, like your legislators, and even your county, uh, your county folks, too, gotcha. like commission to say, you know, we'd like to see extension be able to engage more in local food systems, niche producers. You know, if that's what you all are asking for as um, uh, potential clients and, and constituents, uh, you know, it just helps those folks that make decisions about us and how we can operate know that that's a need out there in the state. That um, they want MSU and our partners at U of M as well to help with. Cool. And, and just to confirm, the one or two things that were the highlights, I don't want to presume. Oh, it's all highlight. It's all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and another sum. Okay. But we did red dot it. Oh, okay. Oh, they're there. Thank it's really you so the much. It's communication collaboration and really that um, expert for the higher level. Thank you. Thank you. And what, just, uh, just a teeny follow-up on the legal help. Yeah. What, what's, the, what's the need there? The example came up. About contracting um, in terms of 
being able to, okay, the, the story problem came up, someone may ask for a lot of cabbage to be produced or grown, and then the other person backed out of the deal because it was like on a, on a handshake. And someone said, well, I, I do contracts. And then someone else mentioned, a lot of smaller producers aren't going to think of a contract. But if there was a way to sort of build that, like a CYA deal for small producers might be a, it's an acronym, I'm sure you all know it. Um, for smaller producers to just tap into that to maybe just kind of draw that up for them. They can download it or something. But did I get that right? Okay. I do have one answer on that kind of. Uh, there is a nonprofit called Farm Commons. Rachel Armstrong works on all legal issues for small farms. She's actually going to be at the MOA conference as a speaker. She's she, coming to Missoula to do workshops. So if anybody is thinking legal help or knows someone who is looking for legal help, that is, Todd. that's a good place to start. Um, so yeah, she'll be offering a six part workshop and Todd was trained as a co-presenter. Or co Back in Missoula. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, December 6th here in Bozeman at the Commons. And um, we do offer a one day pass to the conference if you just wanted to come on that Friday. Um, and I don't know how much that workshop is, but the one day pass is $100. And, and she that also, includes she all has your a, food. She has a full website with tons of information on it. Everything from business entity set up all the way to contracts. So, so it's a it's, it's a really good deal to go through this workshop. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.